Our next talk will be by the wonderful Wendy Knox Everett. She's going to be speaking to us about green locks for you and me. Well, hi everybody. Can you hear me? Cool. So this is going to be a little bit different than some of the other Crypto Village talks. It's not about encryption theory or anything. This is going to be about using encryption for your own personal domains if you have one. So pretty recently, um, Chrome made a change. Uh, they've been driving towards uh, securing everything on the website with TLS and they had been labeling secure sites with a little green lock, which is where the title of my talk came from. But they just recently made an update such that non-secure websites now are explicitly labeled as not secure. They have a really cool blog post about this. This is just uh, about, I guess at this point, three weeks ago, um, where they wrote about how this is part of their goal towards driving to securing everything with TLS. So TLS is really important because it's, um, basically make sure that the integrity of the website um, is preserved. I'm not going to go too much into TLS. I'm assuming if you're in a nerdy talk about green locks, you know what TLS is. Uh, but we're going to sort of dive into um, using this for some of our own personal domains. So this is my personal domain. Uh, I have had a website since like the early 2000s. Actually, I've had a website since like 1995. I've had my own domain since the early 2000s. And it was just running on a Linux box that I was paying space for and I really didn't touch it. If you like go look at it, assuming my DNS is not horked, um, <laughs> it is a super, super simple like plain HTML page. And I kept being like, yeah, I should actually do something about it because I'm such a big TLS advocate and my own personal website is not secure. And I kept being like, well, it's kind of a pain in the neck if you have like a two HTML page website on a very uh, crufty old Linux server that you're just renting from someone. Like, this is a pain in the neck. How am I going to do this without uh, basically spending hours on it because I don't have hours to do? So I ended up getting a uh, TLS certificate for my website. And we're going to run through that quickly. And then I'm going to end up spending the bulk of this time talking about email security because that's one that was actually a little bit more difficult to, to set up. Um, so let's encrypt is probably the most famous way to do this. I'm actually not going to talk about that method because I host my website now on GitHub pages, which is free, which is awesome. I don't pay anything to host my little tiny uh, HTML pages. Uh, and when I set it up, they were not yet quite support, like officially supporting Let's Encrypt, so I use Cloudflare. So my DNS is over there. There's lots of other hosting options out there. You can use WordPress is another very common one. Um, but I like GitHub pages because I already had a GitHub account. Um, I like GitHub Desktop as a tool to push things up. So this may be a little blurry here. This is uh, showing the certificate that's on my domain, um, and it's a Cloudflare one. So I'm going to go pretty quickly through how I set this domain up. Uh, GitHub does not have the best directions, unfortunately, which is part of what drove me to do this talk. This entire experience was a lot of trial and error, and I'm pretty nerdy. So I wanted to sort of document my path through as I did this for people to go back um, and try again. And if you're at GitHub, I love your service. Please uh, make your documentation a little bit more user friendly. So they have a blog post uh, where they announce the Let's Encrypt stuff, and the directions at the bottom are what I followed. They're still pretty uh, up to date. So you start out by creating uh, a repo and you just name it whatever your username is. Uh, my GitHub username is Wendy CK. Uh, then you check it out in the local machine. I'm a big fan of GitHub desktop. I like command lines, but the desktop thing makes it very nice to see like the graphical diffs and everything. Uh, and you move over your files. You can see I have like two HTML files and a couple of images. I have like the world's dumbest website. This is one of the first like not even tricky, but like slightly arcane things you have to do. You create a text file called CNAME at the root of the repo and you're going to check that in. Then we're going to go to settings and we're going to scroll down and we're going to add the custom domain. Uh, you can see that GitHub thinks that my domain is not currently working. This is why I was joking about my DNS being horked. I grabbed this screenshot this morning so I realized I'd forgotten this step. Uh, and of course it now thinks my site's not secure even though it is and the redirect is actually working. So 
DNS screws up everything, even when you're trying to give a talk on uh, TLS. Uh, it is actually still working, so I'm not sure why GitHub thinks it's not. Uh, one of the things that tripped me up a little bit is because I'm not really a DNS person, uh, was I didn't know what the word Apex domain meant. It just means a top level domain like example.com. For me it's wendyk.org. And they're all talking about like Apex domains and I'm like, well I don't know what that is and so I don't think that I have that. But I do. Uh, so that's just a terminology that GitHub did not really particularly define very well. Um, I thought I had like a subdomain like www.wendyk.org. But I don't because I own the domain. So they basically are going to tell you to point to this. Here's my DNS settings. I am copying their directions and putting it in. And boom, I have a secure website. It's pretty cool. Uh, although it, take, it took like 48 hours so that stuff to propagate out. Um, but that is essentially how you use GitHub pages with Cloudflare. The Let's Encrypt setup is almost identical. Um, you're just creating uh, basically that C name um, and you're telling in the setting that this is going to be a secure one. So, email spam is a big problem. Uh, I used to work in email marketing way back in the day. Um, and kind of knew what SPF was and so forth. Uh, and I've had my domain on Google Apps uh, since it came out. And so I was kind of lazy about this whole thing. I'm like, surely Google is taking care of this for me. I pay them $5 a month. I just use Gmail for my domain. I've not configured a damn thing. I'm sure they're on top of this. And then um, I kind of started thinking, like, wait, no, to use SPF, you have to set domain records. Uh, and I don't think Google can go set my domain records. And I was like, maybe I should look into this because maybe my email is not half as secure as I think it is. Or like my email is secure but like my domain could be used to spoof. And because I have a very old .org domain, it's actually somewhat valuable for spam. Uh, so I was like, I should probably take care of this. And then fell down the uh, email security rabbit hole. It took me about three weeks to get this to all work. Uh, and so that frustration kind of drove wanting to do this talk to just lay out my path through setting this up. And sort of raising awareness for people to realize that you do have to go through some of this. So we're going to do a nice jump into three technologies, SPF, DKIM, and DMARC. Uh, and they all work together to keep people from spoofing your domain when they send spam. So SPF is pretty old. Uh, when I worked on email marketing from like 2002 to 2006, uh, SPF came out, I want to say maybe in the middle of that. Like it was definitely around then. This is not a new technology. It essentially allows you to publish a DNS record that says for this particular domain, like for wendyk.org, only a handful of uh, IP addresses can send email. If you're getting email that is from any other IP address and purports to be from this domain, you should flag it spam. Um, and also I'm going to I'm publish these slides to my Twitter account right afterwards, so don't worry too much about capturing the URLs. I've got a whole, like an end slide of URLs for all of you too. Um, but the problem with this is that it requires every single person who receives email to go do that lookup. People are lazy. It also can be kind of brittle. Um, depending on your setup, like if the IP address that is sending email changes, it can be a problem. Um, people who send email from multiple places, so like if you have your company's email and then your company's also sending marketing email under that, maybe through like a mail service or so forth, you have to remember to keep these all up to date. DKIM is the second part of this. It's kind of cool. We can cryptographically send our emails without doing a darn bit of work besides entering a DNS key. Uh, Gmail works very well with this. So if you're just using um, Google Apps in your domain, they'll help you generate the key, which we're about to walk through, um, and you publish it. And these are going to work with DMARC um, to basically help you uh, prevent people from spoofing. Um, because it's a little tricky, it's not actually super widely uh, adopted yet. This is still somewhat niche. Uh, the big providers like Gmail and so forth are using it. Um, but JoQ mail server may not yet support DKIM. This is the headers from an email I sent myself the other day and I just pulled out the DKIM uh, pieces of it. We can see I've got DKIM signature and ex-Google DKIM signatures showing that the email was cryptographically signed. And finally DMARC, you can think of as sort of a block and report. Um, it allows you to publish a policy and to basically see what's happening with your email. You can't use DMARC until you have DKIM and SPF set up. Um, which I didn't realize when I started this. I like jumped into DMARC and I was like, okay, I don't understand what's going on here, what's happening, and had to kind of back up and do the SPF and DKIM first. 
so this is kind of an overview of uh, how DMARC works. Essentially, um, the receiver is doing a lot of the work here. They basically get the email. Um, they're going to go check uh, DKIM, the public key, make sure that this is working. Um, they're going to verify that the SPF is set correctly. So making sure that, like the IP address uh, is a, that they got the email from is allowed to send email for that domain. And then they're going to apply a DMARC policy, which is what we're going to go uh, walk through. Um, and then they generate reports for you. You have very nice, pretty little graphs. So I've got lots of like nice red and green uh, pictures of block spam coming up. If you're on G Suite, which is the Google Apps for your domain thing, uh, they have uh, actually fairly good uh, support. Um, it was way better than GitHub's. And there's also this DMARC analyzer uh, thing as a blog post that's also fairly decent that will walk you through how to do this. So this is a little bit jumping back. I mentioned I use Cloudflare for my DNS. Um, so this is just showing that uh, the place where I registered my domain, I am pointing to Cloudflare DNS servers and I'm going to do all my DNS settings through Cloudflare. I'm just on a Cloudflare free plan. I'm not paying them anything. Um, and there's three different DNS records that we are going to go set up. So first, we want to generate the DKIM uh, public keys. This is basic public key cryptography. Um, they're going to keep the private key. I'm going to publish the public key out in my DNS records. So anybody who gets email from me can go check it. And in G Suite, you basically have to sort of hop down in through a couple settings to get it. Um, you would probably want to, oh, it's probably back 50 page. Uh, check the G, the G Suite help pages before you do this because they do like to basically rebuild their dashboard and this could move. Uh, as of the other day, it was still at this location. And this is what it looks like. Um, it's going to generate a TXT record value for you. And TXT is a type of DNS record that just allows you to publish a block of text. The name of it, as we saw, is Google underscore domain key. And the value starts uh, with this VDKIM, goes out. Um, K is RSA, we're telling it's an RSA key. And P equals um, that whole big long string. So I go to Cloudflare DNS entry. Up at the top, there's a way to add a new record. I tell you I want a text. So for name, I put in the Google underscore domain key. For value, I paste in that whole big value. And voila, I have the first of my required uh, DNS settings up here. So I'm not going to dive too deeply into uh, all of the DK, DKIM tags. Uh, the only required one here is P equals, which is your public key. Um, if you don't have that in your DKIM uh, TXT record, you do not have a valid one. All these other ones are optional. Uh, the only ones that I'm using, um, I believe, are uh, like the K equals RSA, and I think we have V equals. Uh, so those sort of help it figure out what type uh, of key your public key is. So next we're going to do the SPF settings. Um, again, Google has pretty decent help for this. It will tell you exactly the string that you need to copy and paste into your DNS setting. You just uh, follow their directions, copy it, paste it in. So now we have two DNS settings published. And so now we're ready to set up some DMARC domain keys. This is the fun stuff. Uh, I use DMarkian. If you have a personal domain and you don't have a lot of email volume, this is great because it's free. You're going to see later, like, my super low email volume. I just don't send very much. If you're a company, it's also really cool. I know some folks who have enterprise accounts are very happy with it. Um, you do have to pay for those, but you have to be sending a significant volume of email before you're paying for it. So if it's just your personal domain, you're probably going to be fine on the free one. They make you sign up first for a trial and then, um, They'll tell you if you can remain free after two weeks, like you're probably going to remain free. Um, so they have a whole section that's going to walk you through how to add DMARC. These are all the DMARC options here. Um, the PCT is going to be the percent of messages that we're going to be doing this filtering. Some people like to start out with just subjecting 10% of their sent email to it. I send such little email that I just immediately set it to 100%. The, um, RUF and RUA are used for reporting. We're going to see some uh, reporting options that I get from demarking, so I uh, demark in, so I can see like very nice graphs of blocked email and so forth. Um, and if you're using demarking, they will tell you what email value to put in. The P is a policy. 
you can be doing um, quarantining or blocking um, or, and I'm spacing on the name of the, uh, like don't do anything, just let me see what's being sent option. So there's three options there. Um, this is my uh, DMARC uh, TXT record. I went to Cloudflare and I put it in. So DMARCian has fairly good directions. Um, oh, P equals none is the like don't do anything, I just want to see what's out there. I, it's a good one to start with. Um, once you have like your reporting working um, and DMARCian has like a little issue tracker and it tells you like hey, things are great, it's not flagging any issues, which for me it was flagging like I didn't have SPF set up at first. Then you can move to quarantine, which means like, hey, flag these things as spam. And then once you have that, you can move to reject, which means like, don't allow this mail to get sent. Reporting is really fun. The RUA equals option is where you set it. You don't have to use DMARCIN, you don't have to use their stuff for it. You can put your own email address in here and do your own filtering and so forth, but I'm lazy and don't want to write my own tools. I'm using the free tools. They have a really nice thing called the DMARC record wizard. Uh, my DMARC setting came out of this tool. It walks you through it, basically prompts you like what do you want to do, do you want to be blocking, what percent of email, do you want to use our tools or do you want to use another one? And they've, as I've been mentioning, they have really nice reporting. Uh, so as I mentioned, you could use your own email in that RUA tag. Uh, some people who have like bigger enterprises um, are doing that. Otherwise, uh, if you have the DMARCian email in there, it goes there, um, it will show uh, where email from your domain is sent from. I've had some friends who have set this up and been like, whoa, where, where is that email coming from? Like that's within our IP space and we didn't realize that was sending email. So that can be kind of enlightening. Um, threat unknown emails that it flags are basically things that are not um, within your SPF and they're not following your DKIM settings. So when you log in, you get this very nice domain overview. I only have one domain, mywendyk.org. You can see right now um, the SPF and the DKIM state are all set up because I published those keys and they've propagated out. Uh, this is going into um, essentially a summary uh, view that they have. You can export as CSVs or so forth. This is an older screenshot. I had one day when like 36 spam mails were sent from my domain and we blocked them. Uh, it varies immensely, like I've seen up to like 200 and then long periods of time with nothing. Um, the long periods of time with nothing is a little bit more common now um, because I've had this set up for a little while and I think that people are starting to decide my domain is not worth spoofing anymore. But it's really fun when you are getting spammed to go in and like see like, whoa, who's trying to spoof me? This is really cool. Uh, you can sort of dive into like the IP address space, look it up, see what country it is. Uh, it's very interesting. I lost a lot of time just poking at it because it was fascinating to me. Uh, the detail viewer, this is from that day with a ton of spam. And you can see also I'm a very light email user. I sent like four emails on those days. This is well within the range of DMARCian free. I could probably like quadruple or more my email uh, sending volume and be quite fine on the free plan. This is what it looks like now. Uh, I've sent two emails over the last week. Everything's green. Nobody's trying to spoof me. Life is great. Uh, DMARCAN's issues tab under monitor is super helpful. Uh, I took screenshots when I was trying to set this up and I lost them on my laptop so I don't have anything to show you but it would be a little like your SPF is screwed up, go fix it uh, message which I found incredibly helpful. Uh, so if for no other reason than for that, I recommend you use DMARCAN if you're setting this up. Uh, so finally, I just wanted to touch on a couple other things. I am the world's biggest advocate of uh, outsourcing your email. I did email, it's ridiculously complicated. I remember getting pages at 4 a.m. when things went wrong, so I do not want to do this anymore. But I have some friends who, for whatever reason, like to run email servers in their basement. Uh, so if you're that type of crazy, uh, there's two things I want to flag for you. Uh, MTA strict uh, security basically allows domains to require TLS encryption. Um, it's an interesting setting. Start, T, uh, start TLS also allows your mail server to protect against downgrades. They're building um, a list of basically servers that uh, are going to do this and it is basically going to be like um, what happens with the web with TLS. You can say like, no, I, I only support TLS, like please do not ground, downgrade me. And so finally, um, I have some slides or some URLs for you here. Uh, Aaron pointed out that the FTC has a really helpful report 
on um, why you would want to use uh, these email uh, encryption settings. If I haven't convinced you, like blocking spammers is fabulous. You can go read about the FTC. Uh, these how to explain SPF, DKIM, and DMARC um, are really helpful uh, because I had to go very fast over them. And so, cool, that's the end of my talk. Thank you for coming.